<clears throat> Hello there, this is uh, Chris Hughes again. I'm going to be going over some slides over the next few sessions here on the reliability of the New Testament and how it's a witness to the reliability of the Bible as a whole. Um, these are some personal notes that I've made and put into slide format. I do not have the time to try to uh, put it through a movie maker type program, so I'm just got it pointed at my screen and these are my slides. And so, uh, take it as you will. This is uh, just uh, some information I put together uh, on, on why we can be confident that the New Testament is at least, at the very least, accurately preserved over time. And we go into some explanation as to why we have the cer uh, certain books in the New Testament and why we don't have others. Um, and it's just, this is the history of that, and uh, we delve somewhat into um, textual criticism and uh, subject matters, subject matter like that, so we can be uh, confident that the New Testament is accurately preserved for us over time. Now, why, do, why am I doing this? Uh, several have, several religions and skeptics and critics of the Bible have over time attacked it and chosen various routes to go against it, but there's a common claim uh, lately, and been, this claim has been out there for a while, that uh, the idea that there's all these various traditions of the Gospels and what we even perceive as the Gospels, um, you know, presently we have the four Gospels in the New Testament, but all these other Gnostic Gospels have been, have been dug up, quote-unquote, lost Gospels, and some have tried to make the claim that these lost Gospels are equal validity to the New Testament Gospels that we have today in the Bible as we know it. And so the claim was that prior to the Council of Nicaea, which we will discuss, and that was in 325 AD, that there was this mass confusion and all these textual traditions that competed with one another, and all these circulating Gospels and other apocryphal texts that we now call apocryphal, but back then they would have been um, considered, quote-unquote, uh, equal to that of the uh, orthodox, accepted text. And not until later in time did the church decide to edit out, the organized church tried to edit out of the Christian tradition, all Gospels and text that weren't in line with the establishments, newly designed self-serving doctrines and creeds. I think that's a claim that's pushed in many ways uh, by critics of the New Testament. So I would like to show through this presentation that that, that claim couldn't be farther from the truth. And uh, we need to establish the reliability of the New, text, New Testament text and what's in the New Testament and show that it is superior to all other, all other gospel narratives out there. So number one, because the New Testament was, as we have it today, and the books that are there, was so widely uh, adopted, we have, the New Testament has the greatest number of existing manuscripts of any text of antiquity. Um, and that just shows the general acceptance over time. It's a general claim, but as we, it's just one piece of evidence that builds upon others as we go. Um, for, you know, for example, ancient classical works are attested to by very few full or partial manuscripts, usually less than 10 per any ancient work you might be interested in. Uh, but the New Testament has volumes of material. Of course, the more material you have to look at, the more, vi the more variants you might find. Um, but that's not a problem. Things like scribal errors and things like that will pile up because you have that many more documents for it to pile up in. That's a, actually a good thing. Not a bad thing, because um, you have more to look at, more to compare to. You can get closer to the accurate text rather than farther away from it by having these variants. It's what you want. It's not a negative thing. It's a positive thing, as I will show. Um, so over 5,000 full or partial Greek manuscripts of the New Testament exist. And this is not including the New Testament text that you can find quoted in the writings of the Church Fathers. Uh, from prior to 300 AD, prior to the Council of Nicaea. You can reconstruct 90% of the New Testament uh, using only anti-Nicene, pre-Nicene, pre-Council of Nicaea writings. That alone 
uh, gives you a lot of confidence that what we have is accurate. Um, now, of those 5,000 manuscripts, over 40 of them date to prior to 300 AD. It's kind of a key year since so many people try to make a big deal out of the 325 AD Council of Nicaea. As if at that council, all sorts of horrible things happened and burning of books and gospels and things like that that weren't a part of the Orthodox tradition. Of course, that's not true, but uh, uh, books like the Da Vinci Code, you know, written several years ago, I know, but still. Um, books like that have tried to make it look like the Council of Nicaea uh, did a lot of things that it didn't do, and uh, eventually we're going to discuss that. Um, so we have a large number of co copies that are close to the originals, 40 of them, dating prior to 388. That's very good, and that uh, yields a much, much stronger basis for establishing an original text. Um, um, some put a lot of faith in the Gnostic or Lost Gospels, uh, but keep in mind, most of them come from just one source, the Nag Hammadi Library, which was discovered in Egypt in 1948. There are a few copies of the Gospel of Thomas that came from other places, and other, other Gospels, that, you know, little fragments that came from one place or another, but the vast majority come from the Nag Hammadi Library. And so just one source, uh, while there's scattered sources of these 40 New Testament manuscripts that date prior to 300 AD, um, and they're not from just one source. Um, so we have way more copies of the New Testament than any other competing Christianity, quote unquote. Um, so I spoke of the classical works before. I wanted to show. I want to show. This has been shown many times before. Uh, some of the uh, how how much time of how close these manuscripts are of the works like Homer's Iliad and um, Josephus' Jewish War and Plato's Republic. Uh, for example, Josephus' Jewish War. You have nine manuscripts, less than ten. They date from no earlier than the 5th century, which is 400 years removed from the originals. Um, 400 years. You just have nine. But no, nobody makes much out of that. And they still believe we have Josephus' actual Jewish War writing. But that hadn't been tampered with, or no one's questioning that Josephus wrote it, etc. Uh, of Tacitus's Annals, you have it in partial form in just two manuscripts from the 9th century. That's 850 years from the original, yet we believe that Tacitus wrote those Annals, and that what we have is preserving what he wrote. And all these others, Pliny the Younger, seven manuscripts, 750 years from the original. Etc. And you can see the rest, but they're all not very many, and we do have a lot of Homer's Iliad because it was uh, um, well received and people like it. It's, uh, less than a thousand copies though, and all of them are 500 years removed from the originals. While with the New Testament, we have 5,000 copies, and 40 of them are prior to 300 A.D. And of course, the New Testament was written in the first century A.D. before 100 A.D. So, you might be asking, this is from a conservative point of view, but when was the New Testament written? So, start with the book of Acts, written by Luke. Um, at, go to the end of Acts, you'll see that it never records the death of Paul or Peter. And we know that they died in the mid-60s AD. It leaves Paul in house arrest at the end of the book. It never records the death of James, Jesus' brother, either. Which was, and he died around 62 AD. So... Number one, if Acts was um, tampered with, you would think that the tampering person would be tempted to add to the end to make it a nice, complete ending. But that didn't happen. So that tells me Acts was preserved over time and left as is, and then if it leaves out the deaths of certain individuals that we know existed, then we just, nobody doubts that Paul existed, then we can just say Acts was written prior to the 60s AD, probably in the 50s, late 50s. So we know that. Now if the same guy that wrote Acts wrote Luke, the Gospel, then the Gospel of Luke must predate Acts, because Acts was the second book. Uh, so there's this, uh, also this uh, Q document that's supposed to have existed that Luke might have used. I don't have a problem with that theory. Um, it may have been a source document used by both Matthew and Luke, and as they wrote their Gospels. 
So if, if some this Q document actually existed, forget about calling it Q, just some kind of document that they may have used to um, make sure they didn't forget anything as they wrote their their own gospels, then that pushes the first writings of Christ's words and deeds back even further because you got Q predating Luke and Matthew. So these uh, uh, sources go way back, and Q is actually a good thing for. Uh, establishing the early reliability of the New Testament. So, um, so if what, if, if what is said of Acts, what we said about Acts is true, Luke was probably lit, written at least before A.D. 63 and probably in the 50s, like I said about Acts. So the Gospels Luke, of Luke was written within 30 years of Jesus' death, resurrection, ascension, of Jesus' existence on this planet. Within 30 years, the Gospel of Luke was written. Matthew, uh, some believe um, that Mark was the first gospel written, and it followed by Matthew. Um, Papias was a Christian historian. He mentions that the gospel, he thinks that the gospel of Matthew was originally written in Aramaic or Hebrew. Though I don't think that was, pro I think it was probably written in Greek. Um, but Matthew was written to Jewish audience. So it may have been. I don't rule it out completely. Um, so if, that, that would even predate what we have of Matthew way farther back. So we don't know for sure. Um, the earliest quote of Matthew is found in Ignatius, who died around AD 115 AD. But in his writing, he quotes from Matthew. Um, so Matthew must have been in circulation well before Ignatius came on the scene. And it is generally believed that Matthew was written before AD 70, maybe as early as AD 50. Now, Mark is not an eyewitness to the events of Jesus' life. He was a disciple of Peter, and it was Peter who informed Mark of the life of Christ and guided him, probably, in the writing of the Gospel, known as the Gospel of Mark. Um, so Papias thought that Mark, the evangelist, who had never heard Christ, was the interpreter of Peter, like I just said. We get that from Papias. Um, so Mark is thought to be the earliest Gospel, probably written in the 50s AD as well. But you can see that a lot of these Gospels were written in the, probably around the 50s, uh, after the preaching of the Gospel had gone out, and eventually the thinking of the early Christians was, we got to get this stuff written down. Uh, and it was, so it was put down within 20 to 30 years of the life of Christ. Uh, now John, he was the last person to write, and you can tell, that's why his, are, his Gospels are different than the other three, only in some of the structural things, and he was intentionally trying to put in things that... Uh, the others might have left out, um, so he yeah, he added a lot of material that probably having had, having read the first three Matthew Mark and Luke, John wanted to complete the story and add a few things that they had left out, or else why why write another one if the other three had done their you know had everything there, but John thought he could add something, so John was probably written in the 80s to 90s A.D. Interestingly, the earliest fragment of the God of the Gospel of John dates to 125 AD. It's called the John Rylands Fragment. Now that is really close to the original manuscript, the autograph. It's the John Rylands Fragment. It's not part of the autograph, but it is very close to what John actually wrote. I mean, that is close. 125 AD, 80s to 90s uh, was when he wrote it. Within 30 years, maybe, of writing the book, the Gospel of John, you have the an early manuscript of it. A little piece of it, but it is it tells you a lot. We'll talk about that uh, later on. Um, the language of the New Testament. I think that it was all written in Greek. Um, now, like, even the book of Matthew, it quotes from the Septuagint. And a lot of the, uh, you know, most of the New Testament quotes from the Septuagint. That's natural. You write it in Greek, you're going to quote a Greek source from, of the Old Testament. The, old, the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and it dates to 2300 BC, and it was what the New Testament writers used to reflect uh, the Old Testament. And it also tells me that uh, Matthew was probably written in Greek originally, quoting from the Septuagint. Um, but by 200 AD, so the original copy, original write, the original autographs of these four Gospels and the New Testament was written in Greek. Uh, over time, the manuscripts, the, the, the copies of those manuscripts were in Greek, and then around 8200, you see a change in the copies. 
they're starting to become written in Latin. Um, so in AD 95, this is kind of how it goes, first Clement um, was, was uh, from the Romans to the church at Corinth. That's different from, than Clement of Alexandria, who's later on, but this Clement wrote is an early church father. He wrote it in AD 95, his letter. It's not part of the New Testament, and it's not intended to be, but it is an early document, and it does also quote from the from the New Testament. Interestingly, it quotes from the original four Gospels, which is great. Um, um, so it's written from the Ro uh, from the Romans to the Church at Corinth, and it's in Greek. In AD one fifty, the Shepherd of Hermas, which was a New Te it was which was not in the New Testament, of course, and it was kind of an allegory, early Christian allegory that was used. Um, to reflect Christian ideals and morals, uh, but it was not considered inspired by anyone. It was also written in Greek. In AD 200, Tertullian of Carthage was a early church father. He was only writing in Latin, though he was fluent in Greek. Um, and Hippolytus of Rome, who died in AD 235, wrote most of his, his stuff in Greek. But he didn't get much of a wide circulation because by then, around 200 AD, more people were speaking Latin in this Romanized world than they were Greek anymore, especially the common men who um, were living in certain areas. They would have only spoken Latin. And so Greek started to go out of favor. So you see a lot of manuscripts after 200 AD in Latin. So it's not the original language, but they are very valuable still. Um, so you have the growing number of Christians who had their own language preferences, dialects, etc. Um, so by 8200, more Christians among the common people were speaking their own languages like Latin, other places like Syriac and Syria. Um, so you see a lot of, um, like, or Coptic in Egypt. So you see a lot of the New Testament written in those languages scattered all throughout those regions, um, which is testimony to the fact that it spread quickly. And it was, you know, there's a historical nature to early Christianity that no one can deny, having to do with the original orthodox view of this, the, the, the New Testament as we have it today. That's what spread. It wasn't these lost gospels that were really only discovered and found in Egypt among this, these Hellenized uh, people who wanted to be affiliated with Christianity, but weren't Christians themselves. They were using it to uh, facilitate and propagate their own Greek ideas, Hellenized ideas. And so that just reflects the influence of Christianity on some of the, these thinkers in the first, second centuries. But it by no means says that, this was, that Gnosticism was an early form of Christianity. It just tells you Christianity was around from early, the same Christianity that we have today, not some different form, like it's taught by Muslims and other critics. Um, but this is the same, what we have today is what was back then, and it influenced uh, the culture, but some took advantage of it for their own purposes, like we see today. Nothing's changed over time, there's nothing new under the sun. Um, I think I said enough about that. So this, uh, how a text kind of got transmitted, we kind of have to somewhat uh, keep an eye, uh, be, have an awareness of that. You, you, have a, you have a document which begins either from a place, like a pro church province, um, or, or a place from where it, was, it may have gone somewhere, either where, where it, maybe just one copy left a certain spot, ended up in another, like a Pauline letter, and from that other spot it began to spread. Um, because the neighboring churches or provinces wanted a copy of that letter as well. So you start making copies and it starts to spread like a drop in a, like in a puddle. Um, so that's why I have the, like a, a, a rock or raindrop dropping over there, dropping over there, and the concentric rings are the copies. And you might have some variants start to trip in there when you have people making a copy of a copy of a copy. and. Uh, over here in another area, you'll have an original, um, you know, or close to an original, doing its own set of copies. And they may then, two, two areas may collide, 
and you can actually trace that. You can see it happen in the, in the manuscripts where a variant of one tradition meets the variant of another and then you have a new variant that comes out of that. And you can trace it back almost to see where they came from, almost to the original. And you can have a high degree of confidence that you're getting closer and closer to what the original actually said. And most people will, t will say of the, all the manuscripts that we have, and all the variants that might be out there for any given verse of Scripture, you know, 95 percent of the of the, script, of the New Testament is, isn't even up for debate. But the five percent that is, um, it is believed that the variants that do exist, one of those variants is the true text. And in some cases, we're not exactly sure which one of those variants is the right one, but it's staring us in the face on one of the pieces of paper that we have. One of the fragments has got it. So there's no big mystery out there. We, we have it. The, the, the message isn't changing. We don't have like an unclear message now. Um, we're just 5% of this. We're, we're unsure about the exact um, uh, way it's written. Maybe Jesus Christ is flipped with Christ Jesus. I can show examples of that as we go as well. Uh, so which was it? Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus? That's just one easy example. And there's, there's other ones that are a little more difficult, but uh, it by no means changes the, changes the message that's being conveyed. <clears throat> so, um, you, also found, you, you can also, you will also find that there may be some, we could say diocese, like the term Catholics use, but just a province over which a church um, had sway, held sway over that community. You might have some that are a little loose, more loosely organized and allow a few different manuscripts to float around there. And you might have another diocese that's more uni uniformly organized and has a better um, elder structure and they control more what's out there so they somewhat uh, select for a dominant text type. Another region might have a more loose text type so it allows a variance, a little more more variants to exist over here than over there. Um, and I think uh, the Byzantine imperial text type is an example of that, um, where a more uniformly organized area put its stamp of approval on something, and that's, what, that's the type of text that survives in that area. Over here in a different area, you'll see a different type of text survive. But again, these are just subtle differences between variants that, that get promoted in a given area. So, but what we find is um, there is a stubbornness in the, is, is one of the basic characteristics of New Testament textual history. So once a variant or a new reading, reading of, a, of a passage appears, um, it refuses to disappear and it persists, if, even if in only a few manuscripts, and it perpetuates itself through the centuries, and we can see this over time. Um, so, for example, the ending of Mark that there's, there's one version of Mark that ends at verse 8, and another that ends all the way to what, what we have in our present text of the New Testament, um, has several more verses added on. Um, that's 9 through 20, so, so the current uh, copy of Mark, current version of Mark that we have in the New Testament ends at verse 20. Uh, there are variants that, ex that exist out there of Mark that only that end at 16.8 instead of 16.20. Um, um, the point to be made is, uh, um, for example, in the Codex Vaticanus, which is the 4th century, you already have other copies of Mark that preserve up all the way to verse 20, but the Codex Vaticanus of the 4th century um, shows resistance to change and wants to keep its textual tradition, which ended at 16.8. And basically says, this is the end. That's it. Because um, it's preserving that textual tradition. That's very good for us. Because then we can say, we can look at the, uh, kind of where these things originated and have confidence that probably 9 through 20 belongs and may be, uh, may be original. Um, it may have been lost in an early copy. And that early copy maybe was burned or fell off. A last leaf fell off. And then that early copy, well, that's what was copied. All you have is to verse 8, and that's where they keep copying. Um, 
and the guy who gets it next, he may know a verse 20 out there, but he's keeping, he's sticking with what his copy says, and he's not going to violate it because he doesn't want to, he doesn't have that authority, or he don't want to take that leap of responsibility. He's going to just stay faithful to what he was given for his tradition, and that's because they valued what they were given and they were careful with it, and that's a very good thing. You want them to be careful. You don't want them to be liberal and just go ahead and make changes. So this indomitable stubbornness is the basic characteristic of the New Testament textual history, and that's a very helpful thing. Um, so that's the, so Mark 16 is an issue there, but we can have confidence that 16, 9 through 20 is also valid and probably belongs in the New Testament, probably belongs at the end of Mark. I think the same holds true for the peri pericopy, I think as I say it, in John of the adulterous woman, which looks like it's added in and may not have been in the original first, maybe the first volume, the first uh, version of John that went out. Then later on, John could have added it in a second release of his gospel, or someone else could have added it because uh, John may have written it in another way and it was combined into John. Either way, it probably belongs, but some traditions, if it didn't have it in their copy, they left it out, even though they may have known it existed in others, in other copies of John, because they're being careful. But again, it surely belongs in John as well. So, tenacity, another way to put it, defines New Testament textual tradition. Um, so there's no threat here to the text, and it's actually a good thing. We're glad. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that no one went and deliberately burned up anything and tried to make it all match on purpose. That looks, to me, that would be a problem. That would look like we're trying to hide something. No one's trying to hide anything. Everyone's just trying to be accurate with what they were given. Um, so the very plurality of New Testament text types can be explained only by the tenacity of the New Testament textual tradition. Um, therefore, it's a good thing to have these, t these, these variants, not a bad thing. It, variants are a witness to the uh, n huge number of texts that we have, and they are mostly, and we'll go over these as, later on, but these variants are mostly scribal errors that can be easily identified. And, oh, okay, that's a scribal error. But hey, guess what? That scribal error was preserved on down the line. They left it in because who are they? To, who's the who's the guy that's doing the copy? What authority does he have to try to fix it, even though he knows what the fix should be? It's obvious to everyone. But he doesn't fix it because he's, he doesn't have the authority to do so. He's going to preserve what he was given. And that's a good thing. So don't let anyone tell you variants are bad for the text or somehow throw the whole thing into uh, disarray. It doesn't. It helps. It doesn't hurt. Um, those are the most important things I think we should show right now. So I'm going to stop right there and keep going another time. Bye-bye.